Hello everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Uplifting Content Podcast. My guest today is the incredible Greg Braden. Greg, how you doing? Oh, uh, I'm so happy to be with you. I'm so happy to be with our guest today. Uh, I'm doing really well. I'm, I'm speaking to you from a studio just outside of uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico in the, in the high desert under the big, uh, big, big, beautiful blue sky of this uh, beautiful country of ours. And I'm, I guess I'm so excited to talk about this material. So I'm going to follow your lead today. I love it. Thank you. Life yeah. is good. That's a great way to kick off the, yeah. kick off the interview. <clears throat> um, I like to start these conversations uh, by inviting my guests, you, to share with our audience a bit about what you do and how you came to be doing this work. Oh, so you're going to start with the easy questions first. <laughs> I try. You know, you know the hardest thing for an author to do is to talk about themselves rather than, than what they write about. You know that. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it about you a little bit, so be prepared. All right. <laughs> you know, I, um, I'm a scientist. I'm a degreed uh, geologist, earth scientist with a strong background in the life sciences. I, I worked as a problem solver uh, in the corporations in the 1970s in the first energy crisis, 1980s uh, during the Cold War crisis, <clears throat> in the early 1990s, the communications crisis that we had uh, between computer platforms not being able to communicate with one another. And every one of those positions, uh, I, was, I was a problem solver. It, for me, it wasn't so much about the, the corporation. It was about the opportunity for me to bring meaningful solutions to big problems that face our world today. And so people ask me sometimes, they say, well, Greg, how did you make what they feel is the quantum leap from that world to what I'm doing now? And I, I guess for me, I was surprised. It's, when I heard that, it was, it's more, it, to me, it's less of a quantum leap and more of a logical progression. I'm still solving problems. These are just really big problems. Mm. Climate change, uh, the, the, the origin and the rise of hate among the, the many diverse populations of our world today. I mean, the, the really, how we share vital resources, food, water, uh, energy, things like that. Mm. And I, I think the bottom line for me, uh, as a scientist, I was trained to be a critical thinker on the one hand. On the other hand, I, since I was five years old, I've been fascinated by our past. I've studied ancient and indigenous traditions and the indigenous wisdom, 5,000 years mm. of human experience that I personally believe we cannot discount when it comes to the way we learn uh, to think and, and solve our problems. So my question in the corporations during some of the most frightening times mm -hmm. in the history of our world, the Cold War, where we came this close to doing the unthinkable with nuclear weapons, mm. was what is it that we can find in the past that will help us? What, what wisdom did our ancestors have that maybe we are only beginning to understand through science, or maybe we've forgotten altogether, mm. that can help us transcend, not just survive, but transcend and thrive in the new world that's emerging, and when I asked that question, the answer that came to me was, how can we solve our problems if we are not honest about the problems? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the, the answers really begin. We've got to be just very, very brutally honest with ourselves about what we face as individuals in our own lives, uh, collectively, as societies, and ultimately as nations and the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is the foundation, long answer to a short question, that but that... That's the foundation uh, of my background, and that's where my passion uh, really lies right now. Because mm. we are at a very critical turning point. This is not business as usual. And as a geologist accustomed to uh, studying cycles of time, uh, I can tell you that we are living the convergence of a number of, of cycles in a way that we have never seen in 5,000 years of recorded human history, all the way from climate to economy to conflict. Mm. These are all cyclic phenomena that are converging right now. But if we don't know that, and if we are trying to solve our problems through the thinking that led to the problems, that is where we get into trouble. Wow, wow. So here's the thing, so a um, couple of points there. I have a friend that is really into history. He loves it, he's so fascinated by it. And I said, why, what gets you so excited about history? And he says, well, because you know, if people paid more attention to history, we could learn from it and not do the things that, that kind of, yeah backfired and so it kind of uh, speaks to what you were just saying um there about about history um so with you looking back to all of these is that what you mean by your fascination with going back because then you also just said that, that we can't solve a problem with the, the same uh, thinking that created it 
what, what does that look like? What, so what does that work? Well, you know, for me, uh, you know, the bottom line is the better we know ourselves, the better equipped we are to deal with whatever life brings to our doorstep. And, and I, you know, I, I am a systems thinker. I look at the big picture, but I'm not stuck in the big picture. That's the context. The big picture is the context. And then I like to come right down to the nanosecond of my life and my relationships with people, my family, my friends, uh, what's happening in my community, in my society, because if, if we can't make that connection, what good is it to understand, right, you know, right. what it is that's happened in the past? And, and what I have come to understand is that we are, in fact, living this very rare convergence of cyclic phenomenon. It's changing the way that we live, but nobody's told us that on the one hand. And, and uh, in addition to that, on the other hand, what's happening is for the first time, we are globalizing a planet of about 8 billion people, pretty close to 8 billion people right now. Mm -hmm. What that means is we are pushing together populations of culture, mm -hmm. of religions. Different religions are being forced into proximity with one another in a way we never have. The way that women think about men, the way men have been taught to think about women, the color of our saying. skin, the color of our skin, all of this, we're being asked to assimilate this massive globalization through the thinking of and the false assumptions of the false science of the past that tells us that we are living in a world where nature is based upon competition, the fundamental rule of nature's competition. We now know that's not true, it's cooperation. We've been taught that we are separate from our world, but we now know that's not true. We're deeply connected with our world as well as our own bodies. And when you begin to incorporate the best science of the modern world with the wisdom of 5,000 years of our ancestors, it gives us the evolutionary edge to meet this challenge successfully. We, we're not gonna go back, we're gonna globalize. The question is, are we gonna have a soft landing or a crash landing when we do it? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a way that we can come at this gracefully. However, we must change the way that we have been taught to think. We are steeped in a story. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Scott Turrell, uh, an American author, I have a lot of respect for, he says, who are we? But the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and believe. Yeah. It's not just what we say, what do we actually believe? Well, you and I, everyone watching, by the way, welcome to everyone watching this. Thank you for <laughs> tuning in today. So we are the product of a story. We are steeped in a story that began uh, in the modern world about 150 years ago with the teachings of Charles Darwin, suggesting that, that the fundamental rule of nature is in fact competition mm -hmm. and that it is through what is called survive, what he called survival of the strongest. Later, it was interpreted as survival of the fittest. It's, it's through that that we have become successful. You know, and young people say to me all the time, okay, Greg, big deal. You know, 150 years ago, what difference could that possibly make today? And it's a, it's a beautiful question, and they're surprised by the answer. Because when they begin to understand that our society today, the foundations of our society were put in place when that thinking was in right. vogue. So right. our economic system is based on competition. Our corporate models are based upon competition. The way mm -hmm. we share food, water, energy, uh, vital resources, mm -hmm. it's all based upon survival of the strongest. And when you globalize 8 billion people, that model is unsustainable. And it the is. reason is it's not true. It's, it's, right. it's based on false science. And I, I, all it can lead to is conflict and yeah, how, yeah. Well, but, we're seeing but, it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. I'd never thought of it that way because one of my questions to you, I was thinking, so what, what do we go back to? What do we change? And so what you're saying is sort of when this, this way of thinking began. Um, yeah. Well, can you imagine what it would be like to have an entire generation where young people are taught from the, the earliest age where these values, these subtle shifts, but they're, they're powerful shifts of values, Mm -hmm. are instilled where we're part of our world and what you do to someone else you're actually doing to yourself and mm -hmm. where where cooperation intuitively we know this in our hearts yeah. but it's not supported in the universities it's not supported mm -hmm. what we're taught so we have this inner conflict we want to be cooperative but it's not supported in uh, science has been hijacked by politics religion corporations uh, people with alternative agendas, and science can only serve us if we keep science honest. So our job is to hold science, hold the feet of science to the fire of truth. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, the science gives us the reasons 
that we need to think differently. And, and there's a, just a very, very powerful difference. What's happening right now is we are being told what to do. We're being told as a society, as a culture, as a nation, uh, governing bodies are trying to impose ideas on the planet through the UN and, and things like that. We're being told rather than being offered the, the wisdom of, uh, of the deepest truths of our relationship to the world and to ourselves. It doesn't have to be highly technical, mm. but when we begin, when, peop- when, when the facts are clear, people don't need to be told what to do. When the facts are clear, we yeah. typically make good choices yeah. because we see the need to make those choices. Yeah. That's not happening now. So this is why we've got the pushback yeah. on, uh, on the mandates that are coming down. So in a very real way, we're talking about science. This is the best science of the modern world. However, science is incomplete. It's only 300 years old. There are glaring gaps and inconsistencies in what science is telling us. This is where 5,000 years of human experience comes in. Our ancestors, they weren't scientists. They didn't understand what we understand about the physical world, but they did understand their relationship to the physical world. And they applied mm-hmm. those understandings in ways that we can learn from today. And when we marry these two great ways of knowing into a single wisdom, we have something more than science can be by itself or more Mm -hmm. than spirituality can be by itself. It's the combination that gives us the evolutionary edge where we can succeed right now where civilizations in the past have collapsed and failed. And history tells us that they collapsed and failed. When they faced climate change, competition, very, very similar to what we're doing now on on a smaller scale. So my next question is then, like this all makes perfect sense to me, how do we get sort of shift, because there are people that don't, don't, don't want to face, uh, acknowledge the challenges that we sure. face today. Um, there are people that have these interests, just self-serving interests about wealth and they don't want to make the planet sure. cleaner because they make a lot of money burning fossil fuels. Um, what are the next, what are the next steps or like, which I think is, is to do with a lot of your work. Yeah. Well, you know, the wealth can only serve you if you have a place to enjoy your wealth. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think people think like that. They do, so they do they not. Don't. Well, here, I, you know, I was just, I had dinner with a friend of mine in the Washington DC recently and we were, um, you know what? I'm looking at this. I'm like at the bottom of my screen. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Better? Oh, hello. Yeah. I mean, it kind of looks the same to me. And now you're blurry. What did you do? Well, but it, <laughs> oh, you're that, back. That's, you're back. Yeah, you're that, that's, it's an autofocus feature. I, now I, I just can't it. move. I can't move or no, try no, to focus. Stay still. Stay still. Okay, I am. Absolutely. <laughs> still. So, so I, had, I had dinner with a friend of mine in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, not long ago, who um, in the past has worked very closely in the Pentagon and, and you know, the inside the Beltway. And, and I asked this question. And what he said to me, I said, you know, aren't these people these people that are running everything, aren't they interested in these facts? Aren't they interested in the science? And what he said to me is, is the political mindset in DC right now has a, uh, an event horizon of about six months. You know, they're looking six months down the road, they're looking at, or, or the next election cycle. They're not right. thinking in terms of, that. yeah, they're not, they're not thinking in those terms. But you know, when we talk about governments and we talk about uh, corporations, they are people. And the people, what I have found is our events uh, are, are not only in the U.S. So I host events. So this is my 33rd year of wow. doing this work in one form or another formally. And uh, we are speaking to audiences all over the world. We have members of the U.N. that show up at our events. We have members, uh, 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 presidents send their staff to, to see what we're talking about. Uh, head of the uh, world uh, um, the World Bank was at one of my programs recently in, uh, in Northern Europe. Uh, the, they're interested. These are things they've never heard. Mm. And, uh, and in their circles, these are things that are simply not spoken about. And I'm not saying that everybody's going to buy into everything 100%. But what people say to me often is, Greg, why haven't we heard of this in the past? Why don't we know? about the things that you're talking about. I'm gonna give you a perfect example. I'm, I'm going to now go from, from the big picture of the planet down to the human body. Okay. Because this, this is really where it comes, it comes down to. The best science of the modern world is now revealing 
extraordinary potentials of the human body that we've been conditioned to believe are not possible. And as we embrace the deepest potentials within ourselves, we fear change less. We fear other people less. Mm -hmm. And that is conducive to us bringing our planet together. So it, mm -hmm. it comes down to who we are. Mm -hmm. So best science of the modern world, 1991. Scientists announced the discovery of 40,000 specialized cells in the human heart. Now, I say the discovery. They had always been there. It wasn't like they just showed up. But they had never been recognized. No one thought to look at these cells in the way that they did. 40,000 specialized cells called sensory neurites. Mm -hmm. That means they're essentially brain-like cells, but they're not in the brain, in the mm -hmm. cranial brain. They're arranged in the heart as a neural network that scientists now are actually calling the little brain in the heart. Here's why this is important. This neural network in our heart, it thinks independently wow. of our cranial brain. It senses, it feels, it remembers independently of the cranial brain. Mm -hmm. And when this is important because it means every experience that we've ever had, all the trauma and all the love, love rarely is a problem. So we, we don't usually say that we're stuck in joy. Uh, joy, you know, we don't have to dial back the joy in our lives, but the trauma, and we've all had trauma in our lives. Mm -hmm. That trauma registers in the heart and the brain. And we typically think of healing trauma through thinking, through the way we think about our trauma. And it can help. It certainly can help. But many people will tell you it's incomplete. And the reason we now know is because we have yet to address what happens in the human heart. So I'm just saying that because this is how real these cells are. They're not, it's not a metaphor. It's not new age, you know, wishful thinking. This mm -hmm. is rock solid science telling us that we've got these neurons. Well, here's where this gets really important mm -hmm. is through these neurons, we have the ability to self-regulate our own biology in a way that we were never told is possible. We self-regulate how strong our immune system is and our, our longevity enzymes, mm. uh, our ability to tune in through deep states of intuition to, uh, to really understand what's happening in a corporate boardroom or goes beyond logic. Mm. Uh, it gives us the ability to create resilience through our heart. We create resilience to change. And I tell you what, I, my world is changing. I know your world is changing and everyone watching our world is changing. We can't stop the change, but we can determine how we respond to that change in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And what science now knows is it begins in the heart. We used to think the brain is the master organ mm -hmm. in the body, and we know the brain's important, but the new science is showing us the brain receives the instructions that tell it what to do from the heart, and the heart formulates those instructions based upon our perceptions, the way we feel wow. about our world. So if if we feel a sense of well-being and safety, mm -hmm. that is one set of instructions that our heart sends to the brain, and the brain floods the body with life-affirming chemistry and healing and rejuvenation. If we are constantly vigilant and feel threatened in our world, and we live that day in and day out, then the heart sends a very different signal to the brain. The brain shuts down mm -hmm. the healing and the rejuvenation because mm -hmm. The brain is in survival right. and sends survival chemistry into the body, a, a cortisol, adrenaline, nor, uh, norepinephrine, all, all these kinds of, of chemicals. And the, a very sad statement to make is we now have living laboratories that demonstrate this that are called yeah. refugee camps. Mm. And the, in the refugee camps, for the first time now, they have existed so long. There are young people that were born in the camps and know only the life, the very, very difficult life in the camps, and their bodies are now telling us the consequences of living in constant fear, constant vigilance with no respite from that at all. Mm -hmm. Their bodies are underdeveloped. They're small for their size. Their bones are weak. Their brains uh, are small for their size. Their cognitive abilities are not what they should be for a child of their age. And these are all consequences of living, we were never designed to live 24 seven in fear. It was meant to be right. a short, short term response. And then we go back to joy and, and all those things. So, yeah. so the reason this is important is now that we understand these relationships, we have, and we can learn and our ancestors understood the techniques to help us self regulate. So even when we find ourselves in those difficult situations, we take control of the signal our heart is sending to our brain 
very simple exercises in breath, in focus, uh, in tactile sensations. When you touch your heart center, mm. your awareness automatically goes to the place where you feel that, that sensation. And in that way, you shift your awareness from your mind to your heart. You begin to breathe a little That's bit slower. Yeah, yeah you, you breathe a little slower than you typically would in the breath is an independent language to the body. The, the breath is a nonverbal language that the body understands. And the only time you would typically slow your breath is when you feel safe or you have yeah. a sense of well-being. So even yeah. when you're threatened, when you can slow... And mar, I was a martial artist. Uh, I have been since, uh, since I was uh, 18 years old. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the first things we learn in martial arts is even if you're in competition, you feel threatened, you slow your breath and you become much more efficient, much more cognizant, uh, your reflex of, of what's possible, your reflexes are, are much faster because you're telling your body that this is the key. You're not depending upon the external world for your sense of well-being. Mm -hmm. You are taking control and that's where our mastery comes from. As we learn these kinds of things as individuals, we fear one another less and we fear change less. And ultimately, I think this is the key uh, to embrace the, the change that we're seeing in our world. In addition to being honest about what the change is, we could have a whole conversation about mm -hmm. the facts of climate change, the facts of human conflict, and, and I'd love to do that. But mm -hmm. I, I wanted to bring this down to, uh, to our lives, our personal lives. We're more than we've been led to believe. We're not what we've been told. Mm -hmm. And we have this extraordinary ability to self-regulate mm -hmm. our own biology in life-affirming ways, regardless of what the world is giving us to work with. And that's where our power comes from. I love that you've said all of that, this, especially the, the stuff about the heart. Uh, yesterday, I <coughs> interviewed somebody called Joe Weston, and he is all about heart um, <coughs> work. And one of his exercises that I asked him sort of what would be an exercise that you would like the listener to do after this mm -hmm. was just to make, just to, just to be, in, be, be in your heart, like make decisions from your heart. He does these um, meditation workshops, just free ones online. And so th this is a message that's just coming out again and again. Uh, yeah, we, we need to live from this space. So where do people, so with your work, can you, so you've got your books, lots of incredible books and you've got these workshops can you tell us about sort of what people can expect someone's fascinated by this and wants to get deeper um sure. yeah what, what, where, where would be next steps you know i did uh, i did a radio interview recently and um uh it's uh, every once in a while we authors get what are called hostile interviews oh yeah <laughs> and, and this one started off hostile I, I i think it was well intentioned but the guy that was a, a male and he just really didn't get it he said he said, Braden, why can't you stick to one topic like everybody else? He says, man, you are all over the map. He says, what the hell are you writing about? He said, are you writing about magnetic fields of the earth or the human body or ancient wisdom? He says, why can't you just stay with one topic? And I was a little taken aback. It was a 6 a.m. commuter radio interview. It's not what I was <laughs> expecting at 6 a.m. I was a little taken aback. And, I, and I, I said, I answered him and I said, you know, if you look closely, Yes, uh, there are right now in this genre, there are about 13, 12 or 13 books that are out there. <clears throat> and I said, if you look closely, even though the titles vary, every one of those books explores one facet of us and our relationship to our world and to one another and to ourselves. So in a very real sense, I have stayed with a single topic. It happens to be a big, big topic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he said, okay, well, let's go to station break. And then, then they went to station break and and we came back and never talked about it again. But uh, I want to say that because it depends on what, what someone's interest is. What, back in 1986, I wrote my first book. And, and I was going to write about a thousand-page book. It, it looked like this in the manuscript. And everybody said it's too much for one book. Mm -hmm. So I broke that book down, the ideas, <clears throat> down into logical sections. And each of those sections became its own book. And it evolved as our knowledge evolved. We now know much more about the human body and about our past mm. than we knew in 1986. So each of those books, the uh, 2007, there was a book called The Divine Matrix, mm. a very popular book right now. It was the science, the book that pulled together all the science that tells us there is a living, vibrant field of energy 
that not only is out there, we're, we are the field. We are wrinkles in this field of energy. Mm. And our ancestors have always told us that science only arrived at this understanding after 300 years of exploration. And now the question that scientists are asking is, okay, the field's there. What do we do with it? Mm-hmm. And this is a, a perfect example of where our ancestors, three, three, I mean, 5,000 years ago, they began with the assumption that everything is connected. They began with the assumption that we are part of that connection. And so rather than trying to prove it for 5,000 years, they explored how we apply that connection in our lives to become better people and have stronger families and stronger communities. The perfect place where science and spirituality come together The science gives us the nuts and bolts, tells us how it works, how that field functions. The wisdom of our past tells us how we apply that function in our lives. And this is where uh, the arrogance of science has discounted the human experience. And many people uh, in the New Thought community want to discount science. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're honest with ourselves, we owe it to ourselves to draw upon every iota, every facet, every source of information, honest, truthful, factual information, to weave that information into a way of living. And who cares what we call it? You can call it science, spirituality, I'm, I'm over it. Mm. Uh, you know, I have to tell you as a scientist, the moment I began talking about spirituality from the stage, I lost my credibility in a, a scientific community. And, and for me, the trade-off is worth it as it is. Uh, I have colleagues that have shared the same thing. Dr. Bruce Lipton left the university yeah. Uh, experience because his experiments did not support what he was teaching. Yeah. Um, my dear friend, Dr. Joe Dispenza, left his private practice uh, in the healing arts uh, for individuals to carry his message to large groups. We didn't know one another when we did that, but mm-hmm. since then we have come together mm-hmm. and, and others. And mm. the bottom line for each of us is it was worth the trade off for our personal credibility to take well-researched, well-documented science directly to large general populations in the mainstream, because that's where the change begins. And the kind of change we're talking about, you know, we don't have 20, 30, 40 years, you know, we've got to to begin thinking differently and we're making some big choices now. And it's through these methodologies that we're giving people, we're not telling them what to choose, we're giving them the science so that they have all the tools they, they need to make informed choices. And, and I think this is, this really is, uh, again, it's a long answer to a short question. When people come to my programs, each program ha- has a, its own description. It will tell you precisely. Mm-hmm. Uh, some are longer four-day, five-day retreats where we do a lot of personal work. Uh, some are high-level keynotes where we have maybe an evening to explore uh, new discoveries that have only been revealed within the last four or five months. Mm. Uh, and and they, all, they all work together, uh, once again, to help us, the better we know ourselves, the better we can deal with life. I'm, I'm fascinated. I would like to come to one. And You're my just, guest. You're my guest. You let me know. Oh, it's uh, done. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you'll be getting an email directly right. after this. Right. <laughs> I'll right. go find one. Um, what is it like to just to be you and just to, to be getting up and doing this work. And like, I'm just, I just think it's, it's really powerful. What is it? What is it like for you? What's your experience of it? Well, you know, uh, it's interesting. Um, uh, I'm in my, my mid sixties right now and I keep Looking getting great by the way. Uh, well, thank We'll see. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's those, it those long, longevity enzymes. No, I keep getting invitations from, uh, the, uh, the government wondering when I'm going to retire. And I keep getting invitations from people that want to do uh, lifetime achievement videos and programs. And I said, you can't do that because I'm not finished yet, you know? So I, I was talking to Bruce Lipton. Uh, and Who he, I he's love, little, by the way. What a joy he too. is. He's yeah. a dear brother. We toured Europe together uh, a couple of years ago, and we, we just had a blast. But, you know, I was talking to Bruce about this. And he said, you know, Greg, the same thing is happening to me. And he looked at me with the, the way that only Bruce Lipton can look at you, those big big eyes. And he said, he says, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm just getting started. And mm-hmm. I said, you know, I, I feel the same thing. There is, I've had interviews that say, how do you respond to this sudden success? And I said, well, it might be sudden because you read the book last week. But for me, uh, my first public talk was 1986. So, so I think it takes time 
uh, to plant the seeds for new ideas. And what I'll say is I love this world. I, I so love this world and I love the people of this world. And, and we're having a hard time right now. The world is going through a difficult time, but there is a structure to this time and there is a cyclic reasoning for this time. And if you don't know that, I'll tell you what my mom uh, used to say, uh, my mom is uh, late stage dementia now, so I, I no longer have these conversations with her, but she used to, to say to me, uh, and by the way, I just want to ask, this is a podcast, isn't it? Is that what we're it's doing? It's actually both. The video goes online and the audio is a podcast. So we okay. get it out there. Yeah. Okay. So I can, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a direct quote from my mom then. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we can do it in this format. My mom would look at the world through the lens of national television and mainstream media, mm -hmm. and it would frighten her. Mm -hmm. And she would say to me a term that I know many of us have heard before. She said, Greg, the world is going to hell in a mm -hmm. handbasket. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't even know what that, I mean, I know the intent. I'm not even sure what, yeah, I don't know I, I they get a hand basket. Basket part, yeah, no, I've never understood that. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it, but I knew what she, what yeah. she meant. And, and the reason it looked like things are just coming apart at the seams because she didn't understand the cyclic nature and the connections that we now are, are sharing with our, our audiences. And mm -hmm. once our audiences begin to understand, when you look in history and you can see the cycles of climate and conflict, and economies and you see how everything is converging right now and you see how the separation and the fear that we have been taught is what we're what we're trying to to use to accommodate the convergence of these cycles all of a sudden i see this all the time people say my god it suddenly makes sense yeah and 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 it's not so fearful but it is a sobering realization that we're in this precious precious pivotal moment and the history of this planet, when the decisions being made in a single generation have the power to preserve or destroy right. everything, the cumulative history of human experience in a matter of hours. We have that power now, and that's a very sobering realization, yeah. but it also, it also tells us that we have the power to preserve all that we love and cherish and hold dear for future generations, that we have the ability to create truly sustainable, ways of living and thinking and it's 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 about raising the standard of living for everyone yeah. in ways that we now know are possible rather than trying to lower it to support only a few that's a right. that is a way of thinking that that's not change. working mm -hmm. but the bottom line for me where does the thinking look at the hate in the world the hate based upon our sexual orientation the color of our skin our religion the atrocities in the battlefields uh, halfway around the world and the atrocities in the cities that we live in right here and I'm in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. All of those things, as different as they are from one another, they're only possible. They're only possible because of the way we've been taught to think. Yeah. That yeah. thinking originates in our family, in our community, in our, uh, our religious institutions, in our universities. And what we now know, we ask science, to tell us who we are. Mm -hmm. Science is doing that. And a lot of people don't like the answer, but if we can embrace the neutral language of science, it doesn't have all the baggage of religion and new age and all this other stuff. The, just the, the principles of science, if we can embrace those, they give us the reasons to think differently and they tell us that nature is actually the model that we mm -hmm. should be honoring as we build our economic system and our, mm -hmm. our, the ways we share resources. If, if we can embrace those deep truths of our existence, I have tremendous confidence, mm. uh, as well as Bruce Lipton, as well as Joe Dispenza and Lynn McTaggart and Anita Morjani and so many of the people that we work with, we are optimistic because we've seen beyond the speed bump in the road of life. We're at this big speed bump right now, and some people can't see beyond that speed bump. Mm. But there's a beautiful world that's possible, and yeah. it's emerging. We're just not being told about it. It's going to happen. So... I love, I, I love your, I was, yeah, I love your um, confidence in that. Thank you. It is possible. It hundred percent is possible. Um, well, not only is it possible, it, it's already happening. And yeah. I want to tell you once for, for my American brothers and sisters who don't have the privilege and the opportunity to leave the borders of this big, beautiful country, the way that I do sometimes mm -hmm. on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. I want to tell you the world is, uh, is supporting America right now. The world wants America to succeed. Mm. whatever that means and and the world 
there's, there's more of an openness to these ideas outside the borders of America right now than I see within the borders. America is having a difficult time right now. Uh, a lot of it's based on, um, on the battle for our thoughts that yeah. is playing out right now. Yeah. So, but I want you to know, it's not just a small segment of society and it's not just a relatively small number of people. There are nations that are thinking along mm -hmm. the lines of what we're saying. And there's a tremendous acceptance throughout the world, uh, all through South America, Europe, Asia, uh, certainly Australia, New Zealand, a tremendous acceptance <clears throat> to the ideas of sustainable ways of thinking and living based on rock solid science without the religion, without the politics, without the labels. Yeah. Uh, and, and left to our own devices. I, mean, I, I, I honestly believe I've seen this. People generally know how to get along with one another. People mm -hmm. typically, they may not always like one another, but they deeply love one another and they will support. And typically I, I've seen instances, I mean, just that blew me away where, uh, where people can, can do live together successfully, even though they think very, very differently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is, this is the value of us being, uh, of us learning to think for ourselves. This is where it comes back to the heart. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Because the brain is a polarity organ. You've got a left brain and a right brain. Mm -hmm. And if you try to solve the problem, you, not you personally, but if we try to solve our problems through thinking alone, we will always have a left and a right brain, a right and a wrong, a good and a bad, a success and a failure. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of <clears throat> the little brain and the heart, it is not a polarity brain. Mm -hmm. It does not think in polarity. So when we shift our awareness into our heart, and, and it's a very simple exercise to do this, touch, touch your heart center, slow your breath, and, and literally begin breathing as if the breath is coming from the heart. And, and the focus here, when you begin to ask yourself questions from the, the place of doing this simple exercise, now I've seen this in a corporate boardroom. We've done this in corporate boardrooms. Answers come to people that surprise them. They say, I've never thought like that. Where did that come from? And what I get to say is it came from you, mm -hmm. probably the truest you mm. that you have accessed for a long time because you're not going through the loops of self-esteem, of ego, of uh, the rightness or the wrongness of your ideas. Uh, it's called the single eye of the heart. A part of my heritage is Cherokee uh, mm -hmm. from northeastern Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And in Cherokee, there's actually a word for what we're talking about. It's called Shante Ishta. Mm -hmm. Shante Ishta means the single eye of the heart that, that does not judge, but sees what's true for us in the moment. And when we begin to access Shante Ishta in our daily lives, without attaching any baggage to it, you know, it doesn't have to be religion, spirituality, anything. It's just part of who we are. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a part of our extraordinary potential. We're mm -hmm. wired for this. Mm -hmm. Then we begin to, to think efficiently. We are much less reactive. If someone is, has a, an opposing idea, we are much, much less reactive. Mm -hmm. And uh, it empowers us to find really solid solutions in our lives. So, uh, again, this is, we covered a lot of ground in this conversation. I loved but it. It really, it, it's all about us. And yeah. the way we've been taught to think is being reflected in the world as we change our thinking that change will be reflected in the world as well, rather than trying to force change and the impose world. Yeah. the thinking without giving us a reason to do that. So I hope that makes sense. It 100% made sense. And I was going to ask you the, the, to, to provide like an exercise or a call to action. And you gave a perfect, beautiful one about just, you know, hand on the heart. So thank you for knowing instinctively where I was going. <laughs> I didn't even need to be see, here. You're see, how, see how good we are? <laughs> We're so in alignment. Well, you know, and, and yeah. I, I just want to acknowledge uh, right off the bat, I am I work in many different levels of our population. And I know that what you and I are talking about right now is a very different way for some people to think. Yeah. It's not, not the way they were raised. It certainly is not. The, I was born and raised in, in northern Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the, in the 1950s, and this isn't, we weren't taught to think this way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I fully recognize that. And, um, and I also recognize that if we're honest with ourselves, that it is precisely this difference uh, that we're seeking that is helping to guide us to, to navigate through the, the very rough waters that we find ourselves in, uh, in our families, communities, societies, nations, and, and as a planet. 
Mm. So, and it could be really heavy. That's what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you, when you start making these changes, it is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It is, it, there's a freedom mm -hmm. that comes from self-empowerment. And with that freedom, uh, we begin to, to give a different significance to what we see in our outer world. And it helps us to, to move through that world in a much healthier way. So I wanted to say that before we leave today. Mm. It is a lot of fun. It is, I just, I mean, just, of course, being from that loving, heart-centered place versus stress and fear and all of that, of course. Why yeah. Let's just go for that one. <laughs> Why make ourselves suffer? Yeah. Greg, this was well worth the wait. We've been um, trying to connect for some time, and I'm so, so grateful to you for, for speaking with me today and everyone. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I enjoyed this is our first and I look forward to our next. Yeah, and I will be following up following up to uh, to to be your guest at one of your events. I would love to attend and maybe do a little video and share it with the audience about the experience. So yeah, please, please do. I, I look forward to it. Thank you. I want to thank you for what you do because it is communications like this that help us to reach a lot of people that are turned off by mainstream media. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be easier for you not to do these. So thank you for your vision, your dedication, your perseverance, uh, and you're very kind. Thank you for your kindness and, and helping us share this message today. Thank you. Thank you so and much. on that note, I'm feeling very loving right now. Um, thank you to everyone for tuning in and listening, and I will see you or you will hear from me next week. Bye. <laughs>